hello, everybody, and welcome back to the General Eclectic Podcast with Rod Dreer. I'm your host, Kale Zeldin, and we uh, took a two-week hiatus here at the end of the summer and give Rod a chance to get back uh, from Hungary. Rod, uh, how, how are things in Baton Rouge, and what's reentry like? <laughs> God, things in Baton Rouge are terrible. The, the Louisiana is one of the world's hotspots for COVID, the Delta variant. Uh, right. our, our governor of the great state said the other day that we're about two weeks away from the complete collapse of the healthcare system. And yeah, it's really, really, really bad. And um, I went from Hungary, where we have we have over 50% uh, vaccination there, and people have been able to not we haven't had to use masks for two months to now having to be masked everywhere here and it's it's really a, a sobering thing to come back and um i don't know man maybe you've heard a little bit about hungary in recent well yeah you know it's uh you know we are we had planned i think originally to talk some hungary i was going to squeeze uh, uh that out of you here since it's been all over the news and you've been sort of in the wake and in the middle really of everything and we might uh, get back to that but i think uh I think yeah, I think events of the last twenty four hours um, are really going to have trumped uh, our discussion with Hungary. We'll probably get to Hungary toward the end of this podcast. But um, as of yesterday, we're recording this on Monday, uh, the sixteenth of August. As of yesterday, uh, it looks like um, the um, situation in Afghanistan has gone from um, bad to impossibly. Um, uh, horrifying and, and really a, a straight up catastrophe. So um, wh what's going on here, man? This is crazy. Well, look, I, I got up this morning, Monday morning, and turned on the computer and saw clips of uh, big trans U.S. Air Force transport planes lifting off from Kabul airport with men falling off, Afghans clinging to it, falling off to their deaths because they'd rather risk that than be slaughtered by the Taliban. And, um, you know, this... This is just a catastrophe for the Afghans, but just also a moral catastrophe for the United States. We always knew that getting out of Afghanistan was not going to be pretty, but the way we're leaving is just such a shock and a disgrace. I can't even begin to to say what it makes me feel like. Um, to I talked to a veteran, a friend of mine who's a veteran of the Afghan conflict, and he said, you know, that this has broken his soul. Well, and how can it not? I mean, I, I, th I think of so many people involved in this, this operation, which, you know, the scope of the operation is really staggering um, to think about, Rod. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's been over 20 years now. Is that, is that accurate? Or right out 20 yeah. years? Yeah, we went in, I believe it was October 2001. And we had a right to attack Taliban-run Afghanistan. They were the ones who sheltered Osama bin Laden. There's no question that we had a right to go after them. Our problem, as I see it, was that we then decided that with all our power and our idealism and our force, we were going to turn this backward country into a representative democracy. And it wasn't ready for that at all. Yeah, the, the, the nation building portion of that um, really, to me, was the, 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 the massive misstep. Um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, Given the fact that uh, that that Osama bin Laden was was in Afghanistan, and you know that that all made sense. I mean, I get that, and you know, look, I just full disclosure. You know, I was I don't know in my mid twenties uh, when <clears throat> when uh, nine eleven happened, and we were engaged in all that. And so, of course, uh, I like many of my countrymen, and you included, were very uh, motivated and very upset by um, what. I I saw um, these terrorists do to our country, and so you know I was um, a full throated, uh, um, I would even say devotee of of our operations against um, terrorism and terrorist assets and and all that. And so um, <clears throat> I think it's it's probably important that we try to do our best to disentangle these things. But you know, you and I are both, I think, on this side of things, uh, embarrassed. I think by by, you know, I think what was best encapsulated in, in, in President uh, George W. Bush's second inaugural, which was really this kind of um, soaring peon to um, making the world safe for U U.S. style liberalism and capitalism. Fighting evil and all that. And look, let's not, let's not, um, 
mince words here. I mean, the Taliban are evil. They are some of the most evil SOBs on the planet. There's no, I'm not defending the Taliban in any way, shape, or form. What I'm doing is saying about how it is, is condemning our country's leadership for its ridiculous liberal humanitarianism. When I say liberal, I mean classical liberal, like in, such that it encompasses both the Republican and the Democratic Party. Pat Buchanan, the founder of, of our magazine, the American Conservative, he came out from the very beginning, and he, didn't, he wasn't against bombing Afghanistan. He knew that this had to happen, but he said, we better not get involved in nation building. I found a column he wrote in, uh, I think it's July of 2002, warning about this. That old man lived to see himself vindicated. I'm sure he receives no pleasure at the vindication. But th back then, back back when that was happening, Buchanan and the people, the paleocons who warned against this, they were derided. They were treated as heretics by people on the right. And, um, you know, this magazine exists because of all that. But... Um, you know, they just they meaning the the establishment leadership of the Republican Party and basically the bipartisan um, uh, foreign policy establishment, national security establishment. They didn't want to hear it. Buchanan and people like him were heretics. And these people that, that let, led this country over the last 20 years across two uh, several administrations, Republican and Democratic, they have led our country to this disaster today. And there had better be accountability. Well, indeed. Uh, you know, and I wonder how much of uh, the, what role do you think, maybe this is a better way to say it, what role do you think this debacle, this catastrophe that we're seeing unfold, I mean, just turn on, turn on the news right now and you can see it all unfolding in real time, you know, what role do you think that the almost inevitability of this moment what role do you think that played in extending this thing out? Because I mean, when, when I believe uh, Osama bin Laden was 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 killed during Obama's first term, if that if that anyway, it was during the Obama. Yeah, I think it was twenty eleven, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. All right, so we're we're more than ten. Years. So that was like the midway point, right, Rod? Between between when you know that was sort of the explicit mission, I suppose, and and now. Do you, how, what role do you think that the catastrophe that we're watching, which is just really a replaying of the flight from Saigon, right? I mean, I remember seeing video of that as a young kid um, and just being like, my God, I cannot believe it came to that, right? And this is just as a naive American kid, you know. But this is what's playing out right now, right? Yeah, this could even be worse than that because we don't – we still have, uh, as far as I'm told – as you and I are talking, we have hundreds, maybe even over a thousand American civilians still in Kabul. How are we going to get those people out? The, if, we, if we had kept the Bagram Air Force Base open, we would have been able to do this. You know? But we didn't do that. Why, didn't, why did we? I, I don't know. But this is a decision made at the top levels of the Pentagon and, and also with the White House. This it's just such a catastrophe. But now we don't. We hope that all these Americans will be able to get out safely. Um, but where we our country has been reduced to begging the Taliban to let us leave without shooting us in the back. Um, by the time this podcast actually goes live, things could be even a lot worse there. Plus, the all the people, all these Afghans who helped us, who trusted us. You know, we could have gotten them out too. Remember, Trump... And we should, look, let's be blunt. Not only could we have, but I mean, the moral obligation to do such, to me, is the thing that just strikes me across the face. Yeah, and you know, Trump made this agreement with the Taliban. We're going to get out on May the 1st. If we had stuck to that, we could have had an orderly withdrawal. We could have gotten all the, pe all the Afghans who helped us and all Americans and all Westerners out of Kabul. We could have gotten them out through Bagram. But for some reason, I, I hope we get to the bottom of this. It seems that the Pentagon and the State Department just didn't think it was going to happen. And Biden, I mean, I, I, I think that he has to own the, the shit show this whole thing has become. But we have to also say that I'm, I'm glad that Biden said, no, we got to get out of there. Um, because we needed to do this. We didn't need to do it the way it's happened. But I, um, I, all the, these neocons who are saying we should have stayed there. No, it was stay forever. 
We couldn't do that. The American people don't want that anymore. Any government that can't stand up for itself in Afghanistan, we can't stand up. I just don't well, see it can't it can't stand up for like a month. No. No. <laughs> like I mean, the the, the 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 alacrity of this is just stunning. Yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, I saw that um, that all these people I've been reading the papers over the weekend. Uh, all these wise people in Washington saying, golly, we didn't know it was going to collapse so fast. Well, why didn't you know that? What What is the CIA for? Right. What is it for? Uh, how how is it that I, I keep reading these things from from soldiers who were there, American soldiers who were there saying all of us knew this was going to happen. But why is it that the, 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 the soldiers in the field, American soldiers in the field knew this was going to happen? But our senior leadership didn't. I'll tell you what I bet we're going to find, Cale, if, if there's ever a proper investigation here. I bet we're going to find that every one of these elite elites in the State Department and in the Pentagon said, believed only what they wanted to believe. They saw all of this and, and judged it on according to their own prejudices. I mean, I'm this guy, Ghani, the president of Afghanistan who flew away, this guy secular, westernized technocrat, exactly the wrong person to lead a country like Afghanistan. But he was our guy and we stood him up. And in the end, he fled. He fled. And we, God, I I'm, I'm almost feel inarticulate this morning because I'm so angry about it. What this has done to those Afghans, what this has done to the, the sacrifice of all these Americans who died or were wounded in that country. And it's all come down to where exactly where we were on September 11th, 2001. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, this is this is the thing I'm concerned about, that in the recriminations, and there will be bitter recriminations, that it's going to fall down to Republicans and Democrats sniping at each other about who lost Afghanistan. In the meantime, that's going to be where all the, all the sound and the fury and the violence, the political violence is, in the meantime, all these bureaucrats in the military, all these generals who and, and, and those just under them, all these State Department leaders who spent the last 20 years telling Congress everything's fine, telling themselves everything's fine, if they're going to escape and go off to their cushy jobs and defense contractors. Man, it is time to clean house. Well, all right. So let's talk a little bit about that, maybe. And and you know, and I, you know, how do you appreciate the mechanisms in place for an honest judgment and accountability? Like, what what are some structures in place that would make that doable? Like, so for instance, the reason why I ask this question is, you know, we know that if I'm a member of Congress and I push forward and, and vote for a piece of legislation that I think is right, but it it's a disaster. I know that in six months, I'm going to be up for re-election, right? So, so there's a kind of a built-in uh, accountability structure in theory. I'm being, I'm trying to be as uncynical right now as possible. Um, but, you know, I could lose the next election. But so therefore, we're going to see the Republicans and Democrats sort of do that game, which is it's sort of what they do. Okay. But it seems to me that the the mechanisms of mismanagement are so beyond our elected officials. You know, there's been lots and lots of yammering on about the deep state this and the swamp that. But that's kind of what we're talking about here, isn't it, Ron? Yeah, it seems like it is. Um, you know, I uh, we've talked, one of the big themes of, of our conversations on this podcast over uh, the past few months, and certainly in my writing, is the the way how we know what we know. Epistemology, the big fancy word meaning how we know what we know, and 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 not only on the personal level, but on the on the collective level. Exactly. How do we, as communities, as a body politic, uh, as a family, how do we know things? Exactly. And one of the things that we consistently see and the historian Barbara Tuchman wrote about this in her 70, 1970s book The March of Folly is that people in leadership capacities have uh, and just people in general have a habit of only seeing things they want to see and filtering out information that that contradicts what they want to believe 
case in point, uh, I was reading just before we started this podcast, uh, a piece in Politico by a man, I think his name is Carter Malkazy, and he was one of the senior advisors to uh, American commanders in, in Afghanistan. And he wrote this long piece about how, you know, you know, I, I was wondering uh, why things didn't work out for us in Afghanistan. And finally, I realized, you know what? We realize the Taliban are motivated by strong religious beliefs. I was like, imagine that. Yeah, imagine that. It's like 1945 and saying, you know, who who could have known that the Nazis were so obsessed with race? I mean, yeah. But okay, but 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 this is classic. It it shows how our elite are so secularized they can't imagine that there are people in this world who believe in things that are not materialistic and are willing to fight and die for them. This is what this Carter Malkazian, uh, I think that's his name, said over and over, like, we we were so surprised. And it's like, you idiot. That's what the Taliban are. They're religious fanatics. They believe in a strong God, and those who believe in a strong God will always defeat those who may be better armed and uh, and have better training, but who don't have the motivation to fight. So this is the kind of craziness we're at. And so yesterday I put on Twitter a tweet that the U.S. Embassy in Kabul sent out on June the 2nd, celebrating Pride Month, sending out a pride uh, flag. Right. It's yeah. like, yeah. It, it, and some people are saying, are you saying that gays caused the Afghanistan debacle? Of course God, not. Like, what God, I'm saying is... stop the stupid. God, yeah, that, please, this, is, this is how disconnected... Our, our foreign foreign service people are and that leadership is from the real world. We are, the Taliban is close again on Kabul, but our embassy there, one of the biggest embassies in the world, the, the, um, the centerpiece of our intelligence uh, gathering for the whole region is celebrating gay pride in Afghanistan as in we're Afghanistan. trying to fight so Islamic militants. Right. You know, you look, look, Several episodes back, we talked about military issues, right? And that the military has a job to do. And the, the job of the military is to enact overwhelming violence for a specific cause in order to beat back or conquer an enemy, right? I mean, it's very straightforward. Yet, we see this kind of mission creep all over the place. And, 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 and we obviously, we're talking about the military right now, but we can extend this out to a variety of different other institutions that, that we see have been captured and, and routed and rotted. So so on June 2nd, right, when this uh, tweet was um, proudly uh, um, sent out, out onto the interwebs uh, with, a, with a big um, pride flag uh, at the embassy in Afghanistan, you have to ask yourself the question, like, what is that for? Like, in other words... What is the tweet for? Like, what is it intended to do? What is it? In, what is the intended audience? Like, where does that play versus where does that not play? And what's your sense of that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm working on, a, on an idea here. Well, um, I mean, it's all for domestic, domestic U.S. Uh, consideration and for to reinforce among our, our Western European allies that we're morally correct. We're on on side here. I mean, look. So, I, right. So it's a signal, right? It's a signal. It's, it's and virtue it's, signal. It's signaling a, or it's right. It's signaling a kind of virtue to other people who are on that particular website. So, you know, my common refrain when I see things on Twitter and I'll occasionally retweet this stuff out, it's it, it is by them for them. And what I mean by them, I mean the 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 denizens and the and the proprietors of the cathedral right twitter is for them and by them it's a parish newsletter of the cathedral absolutely that is exactly right it's a little bit more slick and a little bit more interactivity but it's essentially the parish bulletin and so it is not in this instance for the afghani people it is not for quote unquote the american people right this is a signal um, to all the other people that are on Twitter, right? So, so as to sort of position yourself on the side of right. Right. right? You know, Correct. History has an arc and all that kind of business, right? And so, how much of our disconnect from reality is driven by the fact that even people in the State Department, maybe especially, but even the people in the State Department, even the people in the military, maybe especially people, 
even the people who who construct and consume uh, the stuff of the cultural elite here you know it's for them right you know like in other words like you tweet that kind of stuff out it's for them so like you're 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 engaged in nation building via twitter and social media no, well and and the disconnect from from reality is really what we're seeing unfold uh, this, yesterday and today and tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Let me give you an example uh, from the uh, whole situation with Hungary. Right now, and I don't want to get into the Hungary discussion just yet, but this is this yeah, is important. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Yeah. No. No. But this is important. This is related to the point you just made. Um, as uh, our regular listeners know, the Hungarian government passed a law this summer. Uh, making it uh, against the law to do um, what they consider to be propaganda, LGBT propaganda, right. to minors, right? And uh, the reason they're doing this is because they see what's happening in the West. They see, all like in England, the 4,000% increase in... 4,000% uh, increase. 4,000. In, in, yeah. In, Audience, in, uh, that's 4,000% in, in, increase. In minors being referred for transgender treatment, hormone surgery and all that in the UK over 10 years. They see what's happening and they don't want any part of it. Well, they pass this law. You can think it's a good law. You can think it's a bad law, but it's a popular law. There's going to be a referendum in that country on this law and it'll probably pass with flying colors. Um, anyway, the, the your EU um, came down like a ton of bricks on Hungary. They're trying to punish it uh, economically and all that, even though it is, un, as far as I understand, under EU law, it is the right of countries to, to set their own policy. But this is just where the European elites are on this. Well, consider this. Hungary is, they're driving Hungary to towards China and Russia with this stuff by trying to bully them on these stupid ideological things that don't really matter ultimately. I mean, what where gays are in Hungary today is about where they were in the U.S. Uh, 20 years ago. You can get, or even better, you can get civil, gays can live in civil partnerships in Hungary. They can adopt, they can live in civil partnerships. But this, you know, we have current year thinking where you know, the all truth that was ever known to mankind has been fully revealed today. And I, I guess my, my point is simply, and this, to tie this back to the, the point you were making, is that, you know, our elites who run our government, our NGOs, all of these institutions are so blind and so full of themselves, they don't understand what's happening in the real world. They, at a time when the Western alliance has to hang together, we need to hang together and we are weak. Uh, they would send a country like Hungary and Poland, uh, drive them to towards Russia, towards China, because, on a matter like this. I mean, it's just insane. Right. And, and I guess that's what <clears throat> I, I guess what I'm driving at here is the you know, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about the real uh, in this podcast, talking about, you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, social media is not real. And and yet, uh, as all of us spend more and more and more time on social media, you know, you run the risk of thinking uh, that what you see on TikTok or Twitter uh, or Instagram is actually real, right? Because you see it over and over and over again. And 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 I I do think this is connected to our cultural insanity, especially when it comes to. Um, you know, uh, 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 trans issues, et cetera, right? There's a, there's a way in which uh, the thing that happens um, online slowly and maybe even quickly displaces, you know, you know your sense of embodied, uh, enfleshed reality. Um, and so when you try to govern that way, I mean, like, what does it mean? Like, we even have that kind of language that, you know, that, that the governing structures are disconnected from, from the people. Right or that the king um, no longer uh, knows what you know the peasants are going through. Right, I mean this is classic you know French Revolution stuff. Right, that the the canard against the 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 monarchy is that they don't understand how bad it actually is in Paris. Right, um, you know, and 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 so I I think that you wonder you know when you're busy conducting this war remotely. 
uh, when you're when you're busy running a country remotely, um, that you actually forget that it's an actual real country with actual real people, and 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 it's that actuality that that really strikes me that the the, the governing like when, when you're you know there's something about the real and the actual that will come back. It does win in the end, right? You know the the, the real things win in the end. The so gods of the copybook headings. You know? What do you mean? That's that uh, uh, famous poem by Rudyard Kipling uh, talking about how these simple home truths that sophisticated people uh, reject, they always, always triumph. And uh, you should go read that. The Gods of the Copybook Headings. Put a link there under this podcast. Yeah, and it's, it's down there. It's right down here. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm reminded of a story that I've told uh, on this podcast before. Um, but it's worth bringing up now about going to Boston uh, a few years ago, European friend of mine finishing graduate work at Harvard and saying that the thing that struck him the most was how the, um, the graduate students the, at the most elite university in America could not hear things that made them anxious. And professors um, accommodated that. They, they agreed not to talk about things that would trigger the students. And my friend, the European, said, what the hell is supposed to happen to my country? You know, we depend on a strong America, but the American elites don't want to hear reality. I think, Kale, that what we're going to see, and I hope we see this, and I hope that there's there's a strong push, because you hadn't heard much from the Republican Party on this stuff. Like, really? Like, nothing, actually. Yeah, no, but this this idea that all the, the, the trigger warnings, are, this is what wokeness is going to do. It's going to make us even less capable of seeing the real world, you know, than we are today. And we see that. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. But not only to our ability to see the real world, but to actually like interact and affect the real world. I mean, I think that what, what all of us have taken for granted for so long is this idea that, you know, look, uh, for better or for worse, at the end of the cold water Sorry, at the end of the Cold War, we were it, you know, and and so whether you like that or not, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like we occupy this position and therefore we have a responsibility to it. And I don't know, you know, and again, this is where I get lost in the various strains of 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 conservatism or, or political standpoints. I don't know where I stand on on this stuff. But I know that it doesn't serve anybody any good for us to pretend uh, that we're not America. Right. And, but we are declining and we're declining because we have been we've made fools of ourselves on the world stage. You know, who's going to trust us now seeing how we handle the exit from Afghanistan? Again, I think we had to get out of Afghanistan. There's no doubt about it because we can't act alone in this world. As powerful as the United States is, we need allies. And uh, we need allies to fight terrorism because terrorism is not going to go away. Um, and in fact, it might come back even more now that the Taliban's back in command. We need allies. But um, what, having seen those Afghan men falling off the C-17 planes as they take off from the Kabul airport, having seen all those poor people rushing the planes, desperate to get on, um, who's, who is going to trust that America will take care of them? I wouldn't. I wouldn't at all. Uh, and, and the thing is, Kale, we had the ability to get these people out safely. We controlled everything around Kabul um, just a few months ago, but we screwed it up. We screwed that, that. This is a problem made in Washington. And, you know, I hope to God that we don't have, you know, showboating senators of both parties blaming the other side for it. There's enough blame to go around, but the blame has to be squarely put on the shoulders of the military and the State Department. And one thing I hope that we can be done with, Kale, is this hero worship of the military. Well, it, it matters because we have trusted the generals for so long. Because you know, after the um, after the Reagan administration, after the first Iraq War, our you know, in, in the Gulf War in uh, nineteen in the early nineteen nineties, you know, Andy Basevich, the uh, the distinguished historian and retired Marine Corps colonel, wrote a book about how pop culture in America had become militarized and existed to glorify the military. You know, and, and Basevich 
was a warrior. He lost his son in, in the, the more recent Iraq war. Um, but he said, this is distorting things. You know, this is making us give to military men authority that they don't deserve. It's going to be dangerous. And, and now we see that. Uh, remember David Petraeus? He was like the, the, our, our Lord and Savior, David Petraeus, the great general. He owns this to a large extent. Um, but we have, we have, we have um, valorized these men beyond their capacity to, to handle it. And so, I, you know, again, uh, uh, Biden, when he came out there and made that, that, that ridiculous, shameful statement about a month ago in the press conference about how Kabul will never fall, a friend of mine who's in the military told me, he said, you know, that was disgusting, but he was only repeating what he was told. All these senators have been lied to for so long by the military and the State Department. Who is going to going to um, going to flush that swamp out? You know, these guys are going to skate and go over to their cushy defense contractor jobs and nothing's going to change. But I'll tell you what I think it might change. Yesterday, Sunday morning, I was uh, reading to my son this piece by Lauren Jadid. She is a veteran of Afghanistan and she uh, she was writing as a short piece. But she was writing about all the things she saw there and just what a complete completely shameful thing this is. And she's blaming her on U.S. military leadership. And um, anyway, I, I showed this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah she's a veteran. And um, she, you know, I showed this to my, my son, who's 17, who's thought about going to the military. And I said, you need to read this. This is what the men who run our military would send a man like you into, men like you into. And, uh, I mean, he doesn't want to go to the military anymore. And I actually corresponded uh, last night with Lauren Jadid, and she said, I, and again, a veteran, she said, I hope that this, that my experience convinces your son not to go into the military. Right. Uh, I, I, they fit, yeah, it is. I got an email last night from a reader of my blog, a, a Marine Corps veteran of Afghanistan. He said the same thing. He said, my 17-year-old son will not be following his father's footsteps. I won't let him see what we've seen there. Again, this is from U.S. He's not talking about the Afghanis. He's talking about our leadership. Um, just this morning before you and I came on, I got uh, a text from a friend of mine uh, in Alabama whose son has uh, applied for West Point and got a packet from them with a rainbow diversity sticker. West Point. These these people who run our institutions, they are fighting the culture war because that's one they think they can win. But they don't. I wonder how many times, Kale, how, how many meetings that our senior military leadership could should have been taken for how to get uh, Americans and Afghanis who helped us safely out of that country. They should have been in those meetings. Instead, they were in diversity training. Well, I, I think that that, you know, look, and I, I want to clarify for the audience. I mean, like, look, if your jam is to is to um, broaden out and increase diversity in the workplace and rights for LGBTQ plus a, you know, folks like go ahead, man. Like, you know, this is a free country like that's your jam. It's fine. But the look, this is the military. You have a job. It's very specific. Like you can't. You know, and, and resources are finite resources, both monetarily, although that doesn't seem to be operable right now, although the bill will come due at some point. But I mean, just resources of time and attention. Like, what do you pay attention to? Uh, construct reality on some uh, kind of way. Right. And <clears throat> the fact that you have um, our um, military leadership academies focused on the fact that we have our, our military leadership academies focused on something which is tangential at best, right, uh, for the overall mission is shocking and sad. And, 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 and I'll skip the shocking crap because it's not shocking anymore. You and I both know that this is bad stuff. We've been talking about this happened. But I think we're seeing, like, what, what, are, what are you and I worried about? I'm not worried about a trans kid, you know, in, in you know, I, I'm worried about, the viability of the country and because we're Americans and we happen to be, you know, quote unquote, the leader of the free world, it's really vitally important that we take our obligations seriously. And, and what has happened in the last 20 years is this long slow motion devolution of serious people doing serious things. 
yeah, no, we're not a serious people anymore. We're ridiculous people. Uh, we, we deserve what's coming to us. Uh, you and I don't deserve it. Our neighbors don't deserve it. But the leaders we have have brought this on to us. And we, all of us, me and you and our neighbors, we have got to demand better of them. You know, last night I, I found online in some armed forces journal some piece by um, uh, an officer who said diversity is our strength. We in the U.S. military have the have the advantage that our our adversaries don't have of ethnic diversity. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, you know what? You know what the 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 strength of the uh, the Taliban was Allah. That, that was their strength. They believe in something so overwhelmingly true and. Uh, I should say, you and I aren't Muslim. We don't believe in Islam, but they have this faith in something transcendent, and that let them allow them to sacrifice uh, to the point where they were able to defeat a much larger, much better uh, equipped adversary, the Afghan army. So, uh, I mean, don't come at me with this diversity is our strength crap. These are the kind of lies that are going to get us destroyed. And I'm not saying that diversity is a weakness. Don't get me wrong here. I'm just saying that. These people who run the military, I guarantee you that that officer, that low level officer, I think he was a staff sergeant or something who wrote that piece. He knows what he has to say to rise up in the ranks and to be able to, by the time he hits retirement, be able to launch himself into a, a lucrative career with a defense contractor. He knows. And that's why he's saying this. That's right. That's right. Well, and, you know, I think, sorry, I have have a little bit of a summer cold, lovely. So that's why I keep coughing. So apologies. But we've talked, uh, you know, about this idea that the bill comes due. And look, Afghanistan is a catastrophe in and of itself. It's a catastrophe. Not only does it mean something in terms of Afghanistan, but it also means something in terms of what we are as a country. What do you think this brings into the discussion uh, from a larger standpoint, from a global standpoint here on? The humiliation is not over. I mean, this is thoroughly discrediting of U.S. competence uh, and commitment. Again, I, I, I want to emphasize, I don't think that we were wrong to get out of there. I'm, I'm complaining and protesting the way we got out of it. And what it what it tells our adversaries and tells our, our friends, our allies is that we are not led by competent people. Our, and I'm not talking about Joe Biden, though he, I, I am talking about him, but not just him. I'm talking about the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I'm talking about Secretary of State and all these people who gave information to the president that was not true. It was not true. And so we, what, what does this say about the judgment of the United States of America and its elites it's it's damning. And so if you are a, um, a third world nation and you're looking around to, to for allies, you're going to look to China, you know, and, and, and might I point out here, this is this is realpolitik at its at its purest and it's wicked. But this is the world we live in. The Taliban have uh, already allied with China and they've said that China's treatment of the weaker Muslims is an internal Chinese matter. I mean, wow. that's it's how like, cold like these that. people are. They believe in Allah, but they also believe in realpolitik. I mean, it's just, but th this is the world. This is this is the world we're in. This is not the world of diversity training and rainbow stickers from West Point and pride flags over the damn embassy. I mean, look, I, I, about that, when I was in Warsaw this summer for a conference, um, my uh, driver took me by. We had a driver taking me and some other uh, uh, Americans. We drove past the U.S. Embassy and there was a pride flag out there. And the Poles were really insulted by this because they knew that it was meant at them. It was a poke in their eye. This is our diplomat. Right. So, so okay. So, let, let's, let's step back for a second. Okay. Neither of us are, you know, are, are sort of State Department uh, rats like we haven't done this work but like what is an embassy for what is the state department for like why would we have an office in poland you know for war like what is that for it's it's there to advance our interests with the polish government 
It's there to negotiate with the Polish government so they can advance their interests with us. It's there for diplomacy. It's there to manage our relationship with the local government. But uh, in this case... So what's the equivalent? I, in other words, look, okay, so, so you said it's a poke at the Polish people, right, to sort of raise this flag during the month of June, which has become, you know, the great, the great month, right, of, of, of the country. It's our defining month now. What, what, what is that for? You, do you see what I'm getting at? Like, what? No, I mean, look, I, I, again, I mean, I'll tell you what it's for. This is what it's for. It goes back to what you were saying earlier. It's all for internal consumption. You know, if if this were about, if we actually wanted to change the policy of the Polish government towards LGBTs, there are ways to do this, diplomatic ways to do this, that don't involve flying the flag as an FU to the Poles, to the Catholic Poles. Um, look, I, I we're both committed Christians. I think it's disgusting the way Christians are treated in many Muslim countries. But as a matter of, of reality, of diplomatic reality, I don't think that the U.S. embassy should be flying a Christian flag to poke at, our, at the Muslim host countries. Um, it's not because I am a less committed Christian. Right. What would be the effect of that? Right. It would break the diplomacy down. Right. It would seem so. It would seem like it would make it even worse. And I mean, here, here's the thing that's so interesting about the leftist. And this is what is being made clear by by things like what, what we're talking about. They're all about decolonialism, you know, decolonize your bookshelves, decolonize this and all that. But they are very quick to want to go colonize other countries and other cultures like Afghanistan like Poland and all that for what they believe in. You know, I, I, I saw a tweet. But, but Rod, but Rod, but Rod, I, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a bigot for, I'm a bigot for the left. So it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I saw a tweet, somebody, uh, somebody recalled from a few months ago where I forget who sent it out, but they were talking about, they were celebrating the fact that Kabul University has, uh, has uh, now has a women and gender studies program. It freaking cobble. This is a country where people need to be taught how to read, you know. I mean, but this is this is our elites, you know. It's just breathtaking. So can I you know, I know I feel like a broken record, but like what is real? Like I mean, like it's so it, it's so decadent, right? I mean, it really is just so decadent. It's decadent and I, I found um, last night, I, f I went on Gallup, uh, the Gallup Polling uh, Company's website. It takes a poll every year of uh, Americans' confidence in their institutions. The most recent one was July this year, last month. And they found, you know, that uh, confidence in institutions overall is dipping. It's actually pretty low, below 50% for most of them. Um but there are two institutions that have really high ratings, way beyond anybody else. Small business, which has the confidence of 70% of Americans, and the U.S. military, which has a confidence of 69% of Americans. That number of military confidence is bound to drop. It ought to drop because we see that they do not deserve our confidence. Not, again, I'm not, let me clarify, I'm not talking about the troops in the field. They do what they're asked and they do it really well. I'm talking about their leaders. Yeah, you have to wonder. I mean, how long? How long is that going to to sustain itself? And you know, um, I, I you know, jumping back here for a second, I don't. You know, when we were kids, that was not the case. This this sixty nine percent approval rating for um, the United States military, man, that was not true in nineteen eighty three. Yeah, I can't even remember back then. But I, I will. No, I mean, I. I I'm just saying, I you know, you know, a lot of that that reputation was built on the Gulf, the first Gulf War. Yeah, well, remember the support yep. our troops movement yeah. and all that sort of stuff. You yeah, know? well, that yeah, the and that's part of what blinds the rest of us. The whole idea that if you if you criticize the military and our operations, then you're not supporting the troops. That is that sort of um, blind uh, blind following is one reason we're in the trouble that we're in now. I hope that this is over now. You know, that uh, when you have troops like uh, veterans like Large Deed and others, I hope they find their voice now and raise their voice to the top of their pitch to say this has to change. These uh, intellectually corrupt 
leaders of the U.S. military have got to be held accountable and they've got to go. But 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 that, that, that goes back to my question, Rod. I mean, how does something like that happen? I mean, you know, that you have a whole leadership class who have who are deeply invested in not having to pay the bill. You know, they're, they're not going to be motivated to, to oh, you know, my bad. Uh, you know, everything, all of the incentives are pointing in the opposite direction of accountability, um, which might also be a reason why this thing is extended for 20 plus years and because everybody's sort of... Yeah, this is something that's beyond my ability to grasp right now. But remember the 2008 financial crash. Well, after, after the Great Depression, the U.S. government had the Pecora Commission. They got to the bottom of it, uh, named names, found out what problems there were, and held people accountable. We didn't have that after, after 2008. They all, they all got away with it. Uh, we were, when I see we're running out of time here. We need to talk about Hungary before we go. But um, I, I, I should point out that one of the reasons that Viktor Orban is now in power in Hungary and has been elected in several elections in a row is because uh, there was no accountability after the fall of communism for those who served the regime. In fact, they went on to reinvent themselves as um, bureaucrats. And they took advantage of the way that the connections they had elsewhere in Western Europe because they had been communist, part of the communist apparat. Uh, and they took advantage of knowing the system and their power and all that to preserve their privilege. They, were, they call the, the accountability, there's a word they use for it called lustration, bringing light to what was previously hidden. Well, Hungary didn't undergo that. And, um, and the people, the ordinary Hungarians saw those who had been their exploiters under communism continuing to prosper after the fall of communism. And uh, it got so bad that in the socialist government, they had elected the socialist government in the 2000s. Uh, these were the people that Orban threw out of office. Uh, because the, uh, there was a famous recording, this, this isn't well known in America, but the leader of the socialist who had been a communist apparatchik back in the day, he was caught on tape saying something like, we lied to the people from in the morning, we lied to them in the evening, and nobody has ever held us accountable. I mean, it's like out of a movie, but this really happened. And when that tape was made, he was talking to his own inner circle there. When that tape was made public, the fate was sealed of these people. So um, the, I mean, people have talked about Hungary's, yeah, just one second. People have talked about Hungary's um, corruption under Orban, and I think that's true. There's no doubt there. But um, it was there immensely under the, the previous leadership. But it all goes back to the failure of accountability for communism. I <laughs> see that we've run out of time because there's so much to discuss with what's happened in Afghanistan. I just wanted to point out that uh, since you and I last talked, the whole Hungary issue has blown up nationwide. Um, Tucker Carlson came to Budapest, broadcast all week, and now suddenly the Overton window has moved towards people uh, on the right saying maybe we have something to learn from Hungary, whereas other people on the right as well, obviously, as a left are saying, oh, my God. You know, we're talking to those heretics. I would simply say this, Kale, about Hungary in connection to what we were taught. We've been talking about this whole podcast. Um, you know, have not we learned enough about making people who might be politically distasteful into heretics such that we don't have, we can't touch them? We can't learn from them. This is a lie. This is a, a lie that we have been living by in this country um, for too damn long. And I hope that, uh, and I'll have more to say about Hungary on my blog. I'll continue writing about it. But I hope that we can look, that, that our, our readers, our listeners can look at what the elites, what the establishment opinion has done to this country and to Afghanistan by willing, being willing to live by lies and not listen to heretics like Pat Buchanan. And we'll realize, you know what, maybe some of us who know something about Hungary uh, have something valuable to say to the rest of you. I'm not saying you have to embrace Hungary. I'm just saying we need to listen. I think that's right. And, and you know, and, and <clears throat> you know, and, and we've talked a little bit about accountability here. And I think that one of the things that frustrates me is that, you know, uh, is that, you know, uh, 
people seem to be keep they keep getting away with stuff. I mean, and we've talked about this cross institutionally, right? I mean, but it, but right now we're talking about our political elites and our military elites, and they seem to keep getting away with stuff. And my question for you and for the audience, and maybe this is something we can chew on in the coming weeks, is what does accountability look like at an institutional and a personal level? Because we haven't seen we have seen precious little accountability. Um, uh, you know, it's like look you. You, you have to sort of own it. You know, you have to take it. And I, that would go such a far way, you know, I, I, you know, in terms of trying to rebuild some trust. Because trust, uh, I think that we're seeing, again, across institutions, trust has just gotten decimated. You know, and that's the great, that, that's the great loss. Okay, I, I'll end on this. This is what accountability would look like right now. As soon as the last plane leaves Afghanistan, uh, President Biden ought to demand the resignation of his defense secretary and the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, that our woke Mark Milley, our wokester in chief. Get him out of there. There needs to be some responsibility. It's not entirely their fault, but I think the way we've gotten out of Afghanistan absolutely is their fault because they came into office at the beginning of this year when we still had Bagram Air Force Base and they knew this was coming up and they still screwed it up. It, to the un- everlasting shame of this country. A friend of mine this morning, Kale, and I'll end on this, uh, he, we were talking about the, the shocking image of Afghans falling off of planes that have taken off from Bagram, I mean, sorry, from Kabul airport, Afghans holding on to it until they finally dropped. You can see this video now online. My friend was comparing this to the World Trade Center jumpers, people who would rather leap off a height to certain death, then suffer the torture of the death they knew was coming for them. What a bookend to our Afghanistan adventure. Mm-hmm.